May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to your God, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. John chapter 12 and part of verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Evan's mother was still pregnant with him when his father died. Even though he did not know his father, he struggled with his father's death. His father was murdered. Evan would often move from place to place to find a home with his family. His family was poor. Others often bullied him at school and treated him with little respect, little to no value. In a conversation with Evan, he tearfully recalled that even at home he would receive whoopings, physical beatdowns on a regular basis. And many nights while living with his family, he would sit at the top of the stairs, curled up, and listen to his family fighting. Sometimes it would get physical and it would scare him. Evan went into such a deep depression from all the violence and mishaps in his life that at the tender age of 13, he tried to kill himself. He wanted his life to end. He would cry almost every night and pray to God, asking that God would somehow take away his pain, that God would somehow change the struggle of his family. He said to me in these piercing words, I pray desperately, desperately that God would do something for me just to take me out of this hell hole I'm living in. Evan had a deeper cry. His plea was, I wish to see Jesus. I wish to see him act and do something about my situation. What happened? What happened after many nights of praying? Let's wait till the end of the sermon to find out. See, our text places us in the context of the Jewish Passover. Jesus had just arrived in Jerusalem on a donkey to cheering crowds and palm branches. And prior to this, we know that he had raised Lazarus from the dead. He had been anointed by Mary. And so all eyes were on Jesus. Of course, some plotted against him, but others were eager to see him. Among those were some Greeks who made a request to one of Jesus' closest friends. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And we know that the Greeks were steeped in philosophy. They were always in search of the truth. And somehow, it is believed that they saw this truth in Jesus. So John would go on to tell us in his gospel that Jesus declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when they went to Philip, they made that request, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. They were a part of the crowd that had witnessed Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But they had not met Jesus in person. They had not met him face to face. Now, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting, dear friends? Because what it tells us is that it's possible to be a part of the crowd that follows Jesus and still never meet him. It is possible to come to church Sunday after Sunday. It is possible to have a relationship with the church, but never develop a close and personal relationship with Jesus. It's something for us to think about. See, it was not enough for the Greeks just to hear about Jesus or to see him from afar. No, they had a burning desire to get to know Jesus more and more. What does that say to you and to me? What is our desire in our relationship with Jesus? Are we merely comfortable with knowing him from afar? Are we merely comfortable with knowing him in philosophical terms? Or do we want to have an intimate and personal relationship 
with Jesus. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. It begs a question about our desire. Despite making the request to see Jesus, we are not sure if they actually met him. We are not. You see, Philip took their request to Andrew, and Andrew and Philip then went to Jesus, but Jesus doesn't say yes or no to the meeting. He gives us no clue as to whether or not he is going to meet them. It is a simple reminder, dear friends, that God does not always grant us the requests we make, but he does provide an answer. And in typical fashion, Jesus responds. What was the answer to their request to see him? He made a statement about his purpose, about his mission in the world, and what it means to be a disciple. We see that he used an analogy about a grain of wheat falling into the earth and dying in order to bear fruit. What was Jesus saying? I believe this is an indication about his death. He was reminding the disciples that he will die and be raised. And then when he is raised and lifted up on the cross, the Greeks will see him and they will see the truth about who he is. He's not just a mere object of curiosity, no, but he is savior of the world. He is our redeemer. He is our deliverer. He is God. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He must die in order to draw us back into the fold of God. I wonder, do you see Jesus for who he truly is? Savior, redeemer of the world? Or is he just some miracle worker who changes water into wine? Is he just some genie in the sky who grants us requests? Do you see him for who he is? If he is truly Lord of our lives, is this being reflected in our lives? Or are people still asking us, I wish to see Jesus in you? Well, Jesus' analogy was not only an indication of his death, it was also an indication of how we should live if we so desire to see him. It means that if we truly want to see Jesus, we must die. We must learn to die. Of course, it's not a literal death, but a spiritual death. It is a death to self. It is dying to the life that we want to live in order to live the life that God wants us to live. Whoever wishes to keep his life must lose it. And then eternal life is the result. In other words, we must die to those plans that are not a part of God's plan for us. And so in my office, I have a quote that says, You can't start the next chapter of your life if you keep rereading the last one. You can't start the next chapter of your life if you keep rereading the last one. Perhaps there's a hint, that's a hint of what Jesus is saying here. In other words, new life can't come without some kind of death. We can't move by standing still. We can't grow by remaining the same. We can't stand out by staying in the crowd. We are called to die in order that we might live. So Paul tells us, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is past. The old is dead. And behold, all things are made new. And so Jesus was reminding them that if they wish to see him, if they wish to serve him, they must follow in his footsteps. If any wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We must die like Jesus did. Well, this text leaves us with several thoughts and questions, I believe, to contemplate. First, it is a reminder that there are many people who are still requesting to see Jesus. In this world of ours, people are asking for Jesus. And they don't even know it. Maybe you are one of them, but you are not alone. 
All of us, I believe, are asking to see Jesus in some way. So what aspect, what area of your life needs to see Jesus? Is it home? Is it school? Is it work? Is it your personality? Is it relationships? What aspect of our lives need to see Jesus? Many are crying out. Every day, as Steve Green wrote, they pass me by. I can see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with care, going heaven knows where. People need the Lord. When will we realize people need the Lord? It's in the cries and the screams of those struggling with diseases and disorders, struggling to keep their children on the straight and narrow, struggling to keep marriages alive, struggling against the ties in this world that want to sweep us away down a downward spiral. People are crying out to see Jesus. And I wonder, where do you need Jesus to be present in your life today? Where do you need him to lift you up, to draw you from, and bring you to himself? That's what young Evan wanted. He wanted Jesus to deliver him from the struggle and the pain of his life, dear friends. Fortunately, in his eyes, it never happened. It didn't happen the way he wanted it to. And so even though he is resilient now, even though he is now in college, even though he is now on this wonderful path, somehow out of this horrible childhood of his, there was one thing that he left me with. And it was this. Where was God when I needed him most? I can't believe in him anymore. His struggle is real. He is still crying out to see Jesus. He still wants to see Jesus. Because somehow he says, I believe this higher being may offer some guidance. But Mario, I just can't believe in a God. What could I say? What could I do to anesthetize the pain? My words may have been meaningless. But what I did was provide a presence and said to him, you have every right to be angry. But in my heart, I prayed that God would hear his prayer. I believe that in order for him to see Jesus, he had to die to some things. He had to die to some of the anger that he was carrying around. He had to die to some of his expectations of God, his understandings of God. And see, that's the second point. Yes, people want to see Jesus, but in order for us to see Jesus like Evan, there are aspects of our lives that must die. Sometimes you have to let go of these expectations and these concepts that we have of God. What needs to die in your life so that Jesus may be seen? What's keeping us from seeing Jesus? Pride? Expectations of what God should do for us? Our activity on the internet? What is it that we need to give up for Jesus to be seen more and more in our lives? Think about it. And as you think about it, be aware of this that comes out in the gospel today. He says, you cannot bear much fruit unless you die. And so the dying that Jesus calls us to is not meant to take away the joy and fun of our lives. He had an interesting discussion this past week at Book Club about is Christianity a joyful religion? And do we believe that God takes the fun out of life? This is not a God who wants to take the fun out of life. He wants to give us life, actually. Somehow, as Christians, we tend to have this perception of God and church as this lugubrious type of experience, right? Sad and mournful. Well, everyone I knew 
that died and left things behind had a wonderful reaction to Jesus. Come see a man who's told me all that I ever did. Ran the blind man and the woman screaming down the road. Lazarus, who was dead, lived again. Mary Magdalene ran away free, rejoicing in the Lord. Those who come into contact with Jesus and who die to self find life with him. And so we must die to self. And finally, dear friends, how are we to help others to see Jesus? The Greeks knew they could go to Philip because they had seen that he had a clear association with Jesus. When others look into our lives, when others look into our church, do they see Jesus? Do they see that association between us and Jesus? We are called to be a lighthouse to the host, to the, a lighthouse to the lost, and to those who do not know Jesus. People are asking, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Are we helping them? Who is making that request in your life right now? Who on your job, in your community, in your home, in your school, is crying out for Jesus, who is the answer for the world today? In other words, who needs you to demonstrate a little forgiveness, a little more love, a little more care, a little more joy, a little more peace, a little more self-control, so that Jesus may be seen? You know, as a child, Whenever my mom would get upset or annoyed with me or try to discipline me, I know that's hard to believe. Discipline Mario? Yeah, right? <laughs> yes, but she had to. And I, smart mouth I was at the time, would say, now, mom, is that really what Jesus wants? <laughs> is that really how Jesus would behave? <laughs> and she said, even Jesus got angry, boy. <laughs> Who is asking to see Jesus in your life? Let your light so shine that others may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. And so when the request is made, Sir, we wish to see Jesus, we can show them who he is. But then more of us then take those prayers, not only to God, but let our lives reflect his glory. Amen.